I wanted to start by asking you a question I think everyone is thinking about it this time. In 2050, are we all going to be useless? <laughs> no, not everyone. As I said, there will be new jobs. There will be things to do. The really big problem is the problem of retraining and reinventing and adapting to the new conditions. Mm -hmm. And this is not a problem we can postpone to 2050 because it's an urgent issue today in education. What do you teach kids today in school that will still be relevant in 2050? There is a, there is a serious fear that much of what we are teaching kids today will be irrelevant, and we don't know what to teach them instead. You've spoken earlier about school having reality maps. Mm -hmm. Reality maps for the future. Can you elaborate a little? For instance, a school today in 2018 is looking ahead. You know, there is a child in class one, is looking ahead to the next 12 years, the next 16 years of studies. What is it in terms of a reality map that they should look at? Well, nobody knows how the job market will actually look like in 30 years, which is an unprecedented situation in history. It, we were never before in a situation when parents and children, uh, sorry, parents and, and teachers, it look forward such a short time and they say, we just don't know what you kids will need to do will, in order to, to have a job and, 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 and be fruitful members of society. So the, our best bet is to focus on emotional intelligence and on mental resilience. Because the one thing we know for sure that people will need is the ability to keep learning and keep changing themselves throughout their lives. I mean, the old model was that you, life is divided into two parts. In the first part of life, you mainly learn. And in the second part of life, you mainly work and make use of what you learned. But this is becoming obsolete. And we need to, the most important thing we need to teach young people is how to keep learning and keep changing throughout their lives. What is very interesting is that you spoke about how artificial intelligence um, is pretty much the way to go. Not that it will take over, but that's going to be a very dominating force in the coming future. And when we speak of artificial intelligence, software engineers come into play. Now, software engineers are the people who are going to be most looked at because these are the people who are going to be developing these technologies. But at the same time, these are men and women trained to design, not trained uh, to uh, philosophically uh, guide our future. So, for instance, if there was a software engineer today and you could have five things <laughs> to tell him in his profession, what would those five things be? Well, we don't have much time, so <laughs> well, let's start with one. The first thing is the absolute need to incorporate an ethical training into uh, the, 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 the career or the, the teaching of software engineers. I mean, of all the people today in the world, the ones that need most ethical training is software engineers, even more than lawyers or, 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 or judges, because they shape the world. And they can call, and, and they need to do it responsibly. I'll give an example. Um, more and more even today, the question of discrimination turns out to be a question of computer designing. If we want to fight against discrimination of women, discrimination of ethnic minorities, discrimination of gays, gays and lesbians, then we need to think in terms of how do we design software. When people today apply for a job, or apply uh, to a bank to get a loan, more and more often their application is processed by an algorithm, not by a human being. So we need to ensure that the algorithm doesn't discriminate against particular people. For instance, the world cases in, in the United States that, of course, you know that you shouldn't code an algorithm with racial discrimination to discriminate against black people. But what happened is that the algorithm started to discriminate against people from particular postcodes, particular neighborhoods, and all the people from that neighborhood were black. 
and the people didn't realize that this was actually racial discrimination in disguise. So if we want to fight against discrimination, the front line now is with these algorithms. I mean, you apply to, to the bank to get a loan, and the bank tells you, no, we don't give you a loan. Why not, you ask? And the bank replies, we don't know. The algorithm said, don't give this person a loan. And we don't understand why the algorithm decided that. We trust our algorithm. The algorithm goes over enormous amounts of data, especially personal data, and finds patterns of people, reliable people and unreliable people. And based on that, the algorithm decides whom to give a loan to. And we, we can't understand how the algorithm is doing it. If we could, we, we wouldn't have needed the algorithm. So these questions of discrimination, now they, they actually are decided by the people who design the algorithms. So they need a good training in ethics to beware of, for example, discriminating against particular groups. But interestingly, organisms are algorithms and algorithms can be hacked. So at the end of the day, is it a catch-22 situation? Because we are, even if you train these software engineers, but at the end of the day, if we are living in such a predictable manner that they can be hacked, is it game over? Uh, no, I mean, it can be used. I, I've, I've focused on the dangers of these technologies. But actually, there are huge advantages also. If you think about something like uh, traffic accidents, then today in the world, every year, more than a million people are killed in traffic accidents. That's more than the people killed in all the wars together. And the vast majority of traffic accidents are caused by human errors. Somebody drinking alcohol and driving, somebody falling asleep, things like that. If we replace human drivers with self-driving vehicles, we could save a million people every year. This is a wonderful thing. Similarly, even if you think about discrimination, then there are things you can do with computers which are far easier than with people. I mean, you can tell managers and bankers and officials that it is wrong to discriminate against women, against gays and lesbians, against black people. And they can even agree with you. But at the end of the day, there is something more stronger than their intellectual understanding, which is their subconscious, their deep feelings and biases. So even somebody would say, yes, it's wrong to discriminate against women, against black people. When he actually comes to make a decision who to hire for the job, he will discriminate because of his subconscious biases. Most of what's happening in our minds, we are not aware of. With computers, the great thing is they don't have a subconscious. Whatever you call the computer to do, this is what it will do. So if you call it in the right way, it's much easier to fight against computer discrimination than against human discrimination. So it's not all bad. And of course, on the human front, what we need to do is, of course, to get to know our own biases and our own weaknesses better. Um, both in order to avoid harming other people, but also in order to avoid being manipulated by the new technologies. Because the way to manipulate people in almost all cases is by using their own weaknesses against them. And the easiest people to manipulate are the people who are not aware of their own weaknesses. And they can't even imagine that somebody might be manipulating them. So in an age of technology, what we really need are philosophers. We need spiritual guides. We need a lot more debate hmm. about what we know and feel inwards. It is about controlling the inside and less of the outside? Well, it's both. I mean, we always needed philosophers and, and spiritual guides, but I think, yes, we need them today more than ever before because we are more powerful than ever before. And because technology is turning philosophical questions into practical questions of engineering. It's really quite an amazing time today to be a philosopher. Because, you know, we have discussions of things like free will or like ethics. For thousands and thousands of years, 
with very little impact on what is actually happening in the world. And philosophers are very patient people, so they can have this discussion for thousands of years and without changing a lot. But now, these questions are becoming practical questions of engineering. And engineers are impatient people. They need answers now or next month. So, again, to give, us a, to give a concrete example, with all the talk about self-driving vehicles, so one of the most famous examples is what happens if a self-driving vehicle is driving and the owner of the car is sleeping in the back seat and suddenly two kids jump in front of the car running after a ball. And the car needs to decide. It has like a half a second to decide whether to drive over the kids and kill them or swerve to the side and there is a truck coming from the other side. It will hit the truck and probably the owner of the car who is asleep on the back seat will be killed. And you need to decide. Now, these are the kinds of questions that philosophers have been debating for thousands and thousands of years. And it had very little impact on actual human behavior. Because even if the person says, yes, the right thing is to sacrifice my life for the kids, when the crisis comes, he doesn't do it. Because he doesn't act from his intellect or his philosophical views. He acts from his gut instincts to save myself. But now, whatever, whichever, you can have the best philosophers in the world. You can put them in a room. You can give them one year, come up with a decision. And whatever they decide, you program the self-driving car. And you have a 100% guarantee that this is what the car will do. And so you, you need to decide. You don't have a thousand more years for the philosophical discussion. The car company won't wait. And... Some people say, okay, we can't decide, let's just leave it to the customer. The car company, let's say Tesla, will just develop two models of the Tesla. The Tesla altruist and the Tesla egoist. <laughs> the Tesla egoist drives over the two kids. The Tesla altruist sacrifices its owner. And, you know, the customer is always right. We put these two cars on the market. Whichever car the customers buy, what do you want from us? <laughs> so if, if we want to avoid leaving these kinds of questions to the market, we need philosophers more than ever before. Which car do you think will sell more? <laughs> but that's a question for later. But it's interesting because you said, let's put all these philosophers in a room for a year and they come out and whatever they decide, that's what we implement. And that's obviously got to be done at a global level. Yes. And like you said, you know, these are all global problems. No one country can solve them. We need global solutions. But in the current scenario, whether you look at President Trump or you look at Brexit, it's more me, my, myself. Yeah. Everyone is closing borders. Now at a time like this, where more and more nations are just isolating themselves, how do we reach these global solutions? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, things are looking bad in terms of global cooperation over the last five years. They are becoming worse and worse. It's a chain reaction. Whenever one country becomes more nationalist, more isolationist, then the other countries around it react in the same way because they don't want to be the only ones who, who carry the burden of all the global responsibility. And this has been the trend in the last five years. And there is no easy solution. I mean, I think we need to raise the awareness of people, ordinary people and leaders, that um, unless we make common cause to deal with these global problems, then everybody will suffer the consequences. And this is why I think it's very important not to fall into the trap of thinking that there is a contradiction between nationalism and globalism. You hear President Trump and, and other leaders like him telling people that you need to choose. That you need to choose whether you're a nationalist or whether you're a globalist. And of course, you need to choose to be a nationalist, to be for your nation. And I think this is, this is the wrong framework. It's a trap. There is no contradiction between the two. As I just said, I think to be a good... If you think nationalism is about hating foreigners, then yes, 
you can't be both a nationalist and a globalist. But nationalism is not about hating foreigners. Nationalism is about caring about the people in your nation, their safety, their prosperity. Now, in the past, you could ensure, you could care about the safety of the people in your nation with little cooperation with other nations. But in the 21st century, it simply can't be done. Uh, and so I think that there is no real contradiction here. And um, if people realize it, this might help uh, turn back this tide of isolationism. In the, same, uh, in the same thought scenario, and I refer to your book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century, you do write that the liberal story is losing the fight. Mm -hmm. That uh, the liberal story, uh, which it sort of gained uh, uh, in the past, is now se you know, seemingly losing out. And very interestingly, you said that countries like India and Brazil that actually did uh, sort of adopt uh, liberal economic policies really grew. Uh, a lot of nations which didn't, didn't follow. But what I did want to sort of point out that in terms of liberalism, when you look at economic policies, for sure, uh, countries are growing. But what about liberal social policies? Mm -hmm. A lot of people in India today would say that our current government isn't all that liberal. Mm -hmm. So is it just about being liberal e economically or it is, you know, you've got to go the whole hog? No, no, no. Liberalism, I mean, the liberal story is much, much broader than just economics. Um, there is a lot of confusion about the very term liberal today in the world. People don't really understand what it means. And very often people think that they, um, again, that they can contrast liberal with conservative and think that liberalism is, is just a small part of the political spectrum. But actually, at least for the last few decades, even most of the conservatives increasingly adopted the key ideas of liberalism to test yourself or somebody else, whether they are liberal, you should ask three questions. Do you think people should have the liberty? I mean, liberalism comes from liberty. So do you think people should have the liberty to choose their own government? Or should they obediently follow some king or dictator? Secondly, do you think that people should have the liberty to choose their own profession and what to do in life? Or should they be born into a caste and this decides what they do? Thirdly, do you think that people should have the liberty to choose their spouse and whom to marry and how to live their lives? Or should they follow the dictates of parents and elders? Now, if you answer yes to all three questions, you're a liberal. And most conservatives, even most, say, of the voters of Trump, they also answer yes to all three questions. So a lot of the people who today present themselves as, as anti-liberal, if you took them and transported them a century back, they would be in the extreme radical liberal wing of, of the political spectrum. And we should realize uh, the, the, what has been achieved over that century. Now, having said that, yes, now the liberal story is in crisis. And the biggest crisis of all is that there is nothing to replace it. Humans are animals, are storytelling animals. We think in stories. To understand the world, we need a story. In the 20th century, we had three stories, big stories about the world. The communist story, the fascist story, the liberal story. And fascism and then liberalism and, and then communism collapsed. And only liberalism remained as the single story explaining everything. And in the last few years, it is also collapsing. And people have lost faith in it. And there is nothing to fill the vacuum. What you see with the populist regimes that are arising in different countries around the world, they don't have any vision for the future. What they sell people is nostalgic fantasies about the past about some imaginary past that we can somehow go back to, which is impossible. And I think the, gr the most severe problem of the political system today, all in all the world, is that nobody can come up with a meaningful vision for the future, for where humankind will be 
in 30 or 40 years. A vision that addresses issues like global warming on the one hand, and AI and biotechnology and genetic engineering on the other hand. You just don't have anybody that provides a, a, a guidance on that. And the populist regimes with their nostalgic fantasies, they can sustain themselves for a few years. But in the long run, unless we can find some new vision, meaningful vision for the future, then we are heading towards chaos and extremism. So, in the current scenario, every person who is a voter and is now looking at his, whether it's a local government, his, his or her national government, when they now need policies mm -hmm. to somewhat get a framework for the future, what advice would you give to voters hmm. around the world yeah. that when a politician comes to you asking for your vote, this is the key question. This is what you must demand. What should that be? Well, of course, for every country, there are different local issues which are very important. But over and above that, uh, three or four questions to ask every politician all over the world is, if I elect you, if I vote for you, what will you do to lessen the danger of nuclear war? What will you do to lessen the danger of climate change? And what will you do to regulate the explosive potential of artificial intelligence and bioengineering? And finally, what is your vision for humanity in 2050? What is your worst case scenario that you're most afraid of? And what is your best case scenario? If we learn how to make use of all these enormous new powers, what will be the best case scenario? And if the politician has no good answer, or if the politician just keeps talking about the past and has nothing meaningful to say about the future, don't vote for that particular politician. <laughs> I have a feeling come May 2019, we're not going to vote for anyone. <laughs> but uh, there is also, interestingly, uh, in the book, uh, you lay down these hypotheses and you, you know, sort of lay down all these scenarios for us. But there was one very interesting bit, um, a very interesting chapter, if I'm called, and the title was, Tone Down the Panic. Hmm. You know, so it was, okay, this can happen, this can happen, this can happen. But it's all right. Uh, all is not lost. Mm -hmm. Can you just elaborate on that? Because we've said about everything that could go wrong. But where does toning down the panic come from? Well, it, it comes from what I talked about in the beginning of, of my lecture here, that when you look back, you see the amazing achievements of humankind, which uh, for most of history are thought to be impossible. For most of history, people thought that it was impossible for humans to solve the problem of famine by themselves. Again, maybe God will do something, but we can't. And over the very short period, just the last 50 or 60 years, we have largely managed to do it. But, you know, 50 or 60 years, there was this huge concern that whether India and China can even feed all the people who live there. And now, more and more, you have the opposite concern. Oh, people are obese. They eat too much. And not just the rich. Also, you see a, an epidemic of obesity and diabetes and diseases related to eating too much or too much of the wrong food, even among the poor population. So, we, of course, we have to deal with that. But we also have to stop for a minute and realize uh, the, the amazing achievement. And it's the same with the decline of violence. I mean, the... It's important to realize how much violence is, is declined uh, because I think it will make us more responsible and more hopeful for the future. If you think that the level of violence is always the same, then you're hopeless. No, everything that people did in the past wasn't enough to reduce human violence. So how can we hope to do anything? It's, 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 it's lost. But if you realize, no, over the last 50 or 60 years, there has been a dramatic decrease in violence. 
This gives us hope for the future and also should make us far more responsible. Because if violence re-emerges, then it is our fault. It's not the laws of nature, it's not God, it's our fault. We should try better to prevent it. And so I think that there is much, again, looking at the achievements of the past, there is a lot of reason to be hopeful for the future. Uh, you know, uh, when you speak about violence in your lecture, you refer to that uh, it just takes one fool, one idiot to start that war. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> but in the current world scenario, do you see more than one idiot couple? <laughs> I'm not in a position to, to comment on the intelligence and mental balance of leaders whom I haven't met. Um, but you certainly see that leaders are becoming far more reckless and far less responsible in their behavior. And again, what we talked about earlier, becoming far more isolationists and nationalists, basically saying we care only about what happens to our nation. We relinquish responsibility for the rest of the world and for the impact of our nation on the rest of the world. And this is extremely irresponsible because in the reality of the 21st century, the idea of independent nations is simply a fantasy. Um, there are no independent nations anymore. All nations depend on one another. When it comes to nuclear war, as long as uh, you know, a continental ballistic missile can uh, uh, travel between the USA and Russia within minutes. So there is no independent nation in such a scenario. Simply with, similarly with climate change, similarly with the rise of AI and with bioengineering, no nation is independent. I think this is a really good time um, to open the floor for questions from the audience. I do wish uh, we could put you in a room with world leaders and talk to them, but I don't think they're that lucky, but this audience is. So here, uh, the gentleman here in the black, in the fourth row, can we get a mic to him, please? Hi, good evening. My name is Sumit Shetty, and my question for you is, in your books, you've talked about the propensity of human beings to indulge in myth-making of different kinds. And I wanted to know what do you think are the most dangerous myths of our generation? Mm. Okay, the two most dangerous myths. The, the question was what was the da most dangerous myth of, of our generation? And I think there are two of them, opposite ones. One dangerous myth is the myth uh, of nostalgic fantasy, which I just talked about. The idea that there was some golden age in the past and that we can somehow go back there. And this is a very dangerous myth. Uh, I'm a historian. What I can tell you about the past, the past wasn't fun. You wouldn't really want to go back there. And even if you wanted to, it's impossible. So when you direct the attention of people towards this fantasy, uh, instead of working to create a better future, that is a very dangerous thing to do. The opposite dangerous myth is technological utopia. The idea that we just need to develop better technology and this will solve everything. And it never solves everything. Again, each, each technology can be used in many different ways. And if you, if you invest only in technological progress without investing at least as much in the education of humans and in the cultivation of human compassion and human empathy, then people will do terrible things with the new technology. It will just make them more powerful. So these are the two dangerous myths of, of our time. Uh, there at the back, the gentleman, the white t-shirt with an interesting logo. <laughs> Hi. Uh, what I inferred from reading Sapiens in the start was that uh, Sapiens as a species has destroyed other species around us, mainly our planet. What it is today is because of our race. This is something I inferred. And the second thing I inferred was that we are prisoners to our own constructs. Um, what I wanted to ask you is, 
there was a big ethical uproar on gene editing and what happened in China over mm -hmm. CRISPR. What are your thoughts on this topic? Mm. And what I'm getting to is that since we are a species that has messed up <laughs> our planet in a way, what is so bad in making a better species? Well, in, in theory, it would be a good idea to create better humans. I just don't think that genetic engineering is, uh, is the way to do it, at least not for now, because we know so little about the human body, the human brain, the human mind, that this is just what I was referring to in the lecture, that we know how to manipulate things long before we have a deep and round understanding of the system we are manipulating. So we, we, it, it, it happens again and again in history. We try to improve something, but because we don't really understand the consequences of what we are doing, it leads to unintended terrible consequences. And if we start doing it to our bodies, to our brains, it's very likely that we will try to improve certain human qualities, which I think are very important. But inadvertently, we will change other things. Uh, to give uh, an example from a recent study, there is a biochemical called oxytocin, which uh, became famous as the uh, biochemical of love because a lot of research showed that uh, oxytocin plays a key role in uh, forming the bond between mothers and children, between family members, between romantic lovers in, in relationships. So people had the idea, wonderful, we now found the key to love and harmony in the world. All we need to do is spray oxytocin in the air and put oxytocin in, in the drinking water and we'll have world peace and global harmony. But then future researchers showed that actually the same biochemical that causes greater love towards people you know also simultaneously causes hatred and animosity towards strangers. Which from an evolutionary perspective makes sense. So if you spread oxytocin in the drinking water, yes, you will create more love in small circles, but probably will increase uh, violence in the world and hatred in the world. So this is just a tiny example of how complicated the human being is. And with the best intentions, if we don't deeply understand the body and the mind, if we start meddling with things, the chances that it will go wrong are very, very high. So I would say we first need a deep understanding of the body and especially of the mind, and then we can think of using the new technologies to start changing and manipulating things. It's a nationalist chemical. It teaches you to love your own and hate the ones outside. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> there, the gentleman in the white shirt in front, uh, the, yeah, with the spectacles. Yeah, hello, Professor. It's a great honor to see you over here. My name is Govind. So my question is regarding a point which you had mentioned in both Sapien as well as Homo Deus. Uh, you said that religion as we know it is in its end days. Its relevance in the current society is over and we are slowly moving towards dataism. So what, but what I, and I was very happy to hear that, but what I observe is in usual typical dataist areas like social media and e-commerce, religion is making a big comeback. Uh, there are online churches where you can make donations to. So are, is religion really going to go away or is it just going to change its face in your opinion? It's more likely to change its face. Religion has been around for a very long time and in contrast to what many religious people believe, it's changing all the time. The Hinduism of today is very different from the Hinduism of 2,000 years or 3,000 years ago. The Judaism of today is almost a completely different religion than the Judaism of, of 2,000 years ago. And religions keeps, keep adapting all the time, and then they keep saying, we didn't change anything. They keep looking back. If they make it, if, if, even if they admit that they make a change, they say, we just go back to the original purity. It was pure in the origin, then something went wrong. We are not changing anything, we just go back to the original purity. And this is usually a fantasy. It's not true. But this is how they, they repackage change. And this is likely to happen in the 21st century too. 
some religions which will not be able to adapt might disappear. But other religions might survive and completely new religions can emerge because there is a very close connection between religion and technology. And we might see the rise of new techno-religions, religions based on technology. We already saw one such important religion in the last two centuries, which was communism. We don't tend to think about communism as a religion, but actually communism makes all the promises that traditional religions used to make. It promises happiness and prosperity and justice and so forth, but not after you die in some heaven. It promises it here on earth. We can build paradise on earth with the help of technology. And this failed. But we might see another round of techno-religions in the 21st century when religions will promise again, not just prosperity and health, but even eternal life here on earth with the help of technology and not after you die with the help of some god. So I don't, I don't necessarily think that we'll see the disappearance of technology. It can combine with new technologies to create very different uh, social and political systems. Thank you. Okay, there are so many hands. I'm going to go right at the back. Uh, the gentleman there in the black Maybe we can give to some women also. Uh, uh. I don't see any women. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> there, the lady in the front, uh, there, uh, you know, yeah, there. Good evening, Professor. Uh, very nice listening to you and very happy that you endorse philosophers because I am a philosopher. Thank you for that. <laughs> Just want to ask you that you spoke about uh, hacking humans and you also said in the beginning of your talk that how we are more at risk of killing ourselves than being killed in a war. Taking that further, today we all know that depression and faulty thinking or erroneous thinking is a big epidemic that the world is fighting against. So, how do you think technology can help in psychological manipulation of human beings for betterment, not necessarily as a damaging factor? Well, it can help in many things. Again, there are dystopian visions involved with this technology. But to speak on the bright side, uh, technology can help us diagnose mental disorders and mental diseases uh, on a massive scale. One of the big problems with mental health care is that it's very expensive. It's often much more expensive than typical health care. And there are billions of people on the earth that don't have any mental health care system to support them. And computers and, uh, uh, and, and mobile phones even can be used at least to diagnose things like depression far more cheaply and efficiently than anything we have today. Your smartphone can be monitoring your behavior, what, not what is happening inside your body, your blood pressure, your brain activity, and also what you do or the, the, what you search online. Today, even Google has uh, uh, new applications that try to diagnose things like depression or stress simply by monitoring the words you're searching online. And the one question that, you know, Google says, we, any question you, you ask us, we answer. There is one question that when you type it in Google, at least in Israel, I don't know, in India, when you type, you don't get the answer. The question is how to kill myself, how to commit suicide. True. Instead of telling you how to do it, it gives you uh, the number of a kind of hotline yes. for, uh, 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 for, for mental health care. So, again, it can go in terrible ways also. True. I don't want to praise it too much. But think of a situation when your mobile phone, maybe of, say you are a parent, you're a parent and you have a teenage daughter and she's depressed and you don't even know it, but the mobile phone alerts you that your daughter is in severe depression. So this is especially important for people, for classes, for countries that cannot provide uh, good mental health care of the kind that we see in the rich countries today. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Okay, I'm particularly looking for women now. The lady at the back <laughs> in the red. <laughs> Hi, um, this is regarding what you had mentioned about uh, violence and wars being a thing of the past. Oh, not a thing of the past. They're still there, just less of them. Less of them. So, what I feel in this is that um, that was imperialism in the physical sense, acquisition of land, people and power. But that's still there. The face of it has changed. It's neo-imperialism. It's more about global corporations and conglomerations doing it and it's now about data acquisition. Mm -hmm. So it may not be outright violence, but I think we are still looking at some bloodless coups all over. So where do you think this takes us? What does it bode for us? Yeah, this is a very important question. I mean, even though war is declining, imperialism and colonialism could take new forms. Uh, in the 19th century, you had the Industrial Revolution, a few countries industrialized first, and they then conquered and dominated everybody else. Like Britain industrialized first, and this gave it the power to conquer and dominate and exploit India. And this might happen again with AI. A few countries, maybe different countries this time, maybe this time it's China and the US, and not Britain and France, they will lead the AI revolution, and this will give us them so much power that they can then, even without military conquest, they can dominate the rest of the world. And we can also see something like data colonialism, which is already beginning now, that, you know, in the old days of colonialism, so the imperial power would take raw materials from the colony, transport it to the imperial center, say to Britain, they manufacture the, uh, the finished goods and send it back to sell in the colonies. And this is now beginning to happen with data. The data is being harvested and mined all over the world by a few corporations and countries, especially in, in China and in the US. The data is then transferred to the hub. It's being analyzed and processed, used to make new technologies and products, which are then sold back to the data colonies. And to give a very important example, we now see uh, there is a huge uh, interest in self-driving vehicles. Now, what is the biggest obstacle for developing self-driving vehicles? The biggest obstacle is that they are unsafe at present. And Developed countries, like the US, like Germany, they don't want to allow self-driving vehicles on the road before they are made safe. But if you don't allow them on the road, you cannot really fix their problems, because no matter how many experiments you do in a laboratory, it doesn't really give you the necessary data about real-life situations. So the danger is that big corporations will start uh, using or selling these self-driving vehicles in developing countries which have much laxer regulations and rules. And there will be accidents in these countries, but who cares? And people will get killed. And the data you uh, 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 harvested from that, those accidents and problems will then be used to upgrade and perfect the self-driving vehicles, and then they can sell them everywhere. And the highest price will be paid by the people in the data colony, whereas all the revenues and benefits will go to the rich country, to the AI leader, which dominates the self-driving vehicle industry. So this is a new form of imperialism and colonialism, which should, we should be aware of. And, you know, it's quite amazing that, you know, if, if today a corporation wants to come and mine iron, it has to pay something to the country where it, it mines the iron. But if it wants to come and mine data, it doesn't pay anything. And data is today far more valuable than iron. This is the basis 
for the future industries of the 21st century. So these are the kinds of issues, again, coming back to global cooperation. For a single country to resist this, it's very difficult. But we could maybe have a union of data producing countries, like you have a union of oil producing countries, OPEC, which really increase the power of the oil producing countries. So you can have the same model maybe for a data producing countries having a union and able to negotiate better, better deal, a better deal to get something in return for all the data they are providing. So those who control data will control the world. Yes, at present it seems very likely that those who control the data will control the world and most of the data in the world at present is going to only two places, China and the US. Here, yeah, the lady in front in the gray suit. Hi, my name is Eka Banerjee and I'd like to bring your attention to three things you spoke about. One, of course, was the disruptive technology, we've all spoken about it. The other was about humans going within ourselves so going within rather than going without. And then you spoke about how uh, that life hack, the biohack, is about better biology, better data, and better understanding of te technology, computing. My question to you is that while we are focusing intensively on creating better technology, and you actually spoke about how we've been better human beings, truer to ourselves mm -hmm. when we've created technology, how, and, and you've spoken about how technology can enable us to think better, but is there a hack for becoming better human beings? Mm. Not creating better human beings, but reaching within to become better human beings, and is that the hope for the future? Well, there are many ways <laughs> to try and become better human beings. You have, you know, all the spiritual traditions of history out there, and also the new traditions like psychotherapy is, is there, so I personally try to become a better human being by practicing meditation. I'm tomorrow, I'm, I'm in Mumbai on my way to going for a 60 days meditation retreat. Uh, and this is how I try to make myself a better human being. Uh, there are other methods, there are hundreds of different meditation techniques. Uh, some people, they don't, they, they don't find meditation useful. They can use art or therapy or even sport to get to know themselves better, to get to know their weaknesses, to, 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 to develop their compassion and, and, their, and their human qualities. Um, different methods made my work better for different people. Whichever method works for you, I would say do it quickly because we don't have much time. And with regard to technology, again, technology is not just the enemy. It can also be very helpful. Technology can be used also to protect us. I mean, at present, most of the development of AI focuses on creating AI tools that monitor people, individuals, in the service of a corporation or a government. But we can create the opposite kind of tools. We can create AI that monitors the government in our service. For example, to fight government corruption. If they like monitoring the citizens so much, why not monitor the officials a little? So we can, we can also create the opposite kind of, of monitoring. And similarly, you know, you have all the, when, you, when you serve the internet, there are many AI systems that are trying to hack your brain to get to know you and sell you something or manipulate your political views. And it's very difficult to protect yourself. We can develop an AI sidekick that serves you and not these corporations or politicians. We now have an antivirus for the, for the computer that protects the computer against viruses. We can develop antiviruses for the mind that when you surf the internet um, and somebody is trying to manipulate you, the antivirus comes into action and mainly blocks this fake news story or blocks this video or whatever. So technology can be used, again, for, for good as well as for bad. It's really, it goes back to the question about the software engineers, that the software engineers should have a very clear ethical view 
of what they are doing and why they are doing it. Over the last 20 years, we had some of the smartest people in the world working on making people click on advertisements and on funny cat videos. And they were extremely successful in, in doing that. The same smart people, if, they give, if we give them a different task, a better task, or if they give themselves a better task, I think they can do that also. So humans need to start very soon. All of us need to start very soon to become better uh, because we don't have much time. And sadly, tonight, we don't have any more time. One last question. <laughs> Uh, that's a huge yeah, responsibility. That lady. So we're going to finish. Yeah, the young girl here. Hello, Dr. Harari. My name is Supriya. Um, my question to you is about your writing process. Uh, we're all, uh, and a lot of us here are in awe of your writing and your books. A book like Sapien and a book like 21 Lessons, which deals with a multi dimensional approach to concepts and complex matters. How do you go about writing those? Could you tell us a bit about your process as an mm. author? Give your secrets away tonight. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> um, much of it is actually written in conversations like, like the one we are having now. All my three books were written in conversation. Uh, the first book, Sapiens, was written in conversation with my students at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I was teaching a course about the history of the world for something like 10 years. And this gave me the ability to experiment with ideas, to hear what the students are most interested in. If something was boring or if they didn't understand something, then I, I realized I had to learn more and to explain it maybe in a different way. And the, se and the other books, Homo Deus and 21 Lessons, after Sapiens came out, then I had many conversations like this. So the kind of questions that people asked me these eventually became the chapters in the book. So really 21 lessons, it's 21 chapters, each about some big question. And most of these questions, they actually came from journalists or from readers or, or from other people that I met. And also I would say that in my writings, I try to focus on the questions and not on the answers. I, if there is some big question that interests me, then I will follow the question wherever it leads me. And even if I don't find an answer, that's fine. I think that ultimately the most important thing I can offer people is to focus on the important questions. They don't have to accept the answers that I have. And to some questions, I don't have any answers. But I try to focus the public conversation on the most important questions that now face humankind. Um, and as long as we agree on the questions, then this is a very large step towards finding answers and solutions. I think we'll never have enough time with Professor Harari. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>